Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today. I'm Todd Becker, and we're talking today with Mickey Bandur about how our Paleolithic ancestors ate and lived and what it means for modern humans. And Mickey received his PhD in paleoanthropology when he was 67 years old, which is my age. <laughs> and he's since made a name for himself publishing and speaking for both academic and popular audiences. His paper, The Evolution of the Human Trophic Level During the Pleistocene, became the most cited paper in 2021 in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. He's presented his work at numerous conferences, including several times at the Ancestral Health Symposium. And his recent book, Live Paleo Style, it takes a fresh look at how the mismatch between our evolutionary origins and the circumstances of modern society manifest not just in diet and health, but more broadly in our social and emotional life. So today we'll dive into the paleoanthropological evidence that humans evolved as hunters and meat eaters and meat remains the food we're best adapted to eat for health. And as you'll hear, the evidence takes many different forms, including archaeological, anatomical, physiological, and ecological findings. But we'll go beyond diet to consider cultural and behavioral implications of our background as hunter-gatherers and what that suggests for increasing human happiness and flourishing. So welcome to Ancestral Health today, Mickey. Thank you. It's a big pleasure for me. Ancestral Health is uh, was the first uh, place where I lectured in, in the United States in 2012 or 11, I'm not sure. Yes, so, 2012, yeah, I think. I have a very warm feelings, uh, I feelings that. towards uh, NGS. Yeah. Well, in uh, Harvard, before, yeah. yeah. So, Mickey, before we dive into your research, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this? Because I understand you came somewhat late in life to this interest in human origins and ancestral diet. And you were actually trained as an economist and you worked in the corporate world. So what what explains that transition? What got you interested in this second career in paleoanthropology and also in the paleo diet? Well, I, I actually I started looking up to uh, hunter gatherers as model, as a model when I was in uh, university doing my uh, a BA in economics, uh, and I noticed the difference between me and my wife <laughs> in navigating, in finding things, uh, and I related that to, to you know to our uh, genetic inheritance as a hunter hunter gatherers. Uh, and when I retired, I mean I I retired at 52. I decided not to work anymore. Uh, and then I, I don't I don't remember what I thought about it before or after, but uh, actually it's unnatural for humans to work for so such a long time in in a six to six to whatever eight <laughs> eight hours uh, shifts uh, and uh, you know getting paid for it. So the whole thing looked a little bit, uh, and I had enough just accumulated enough wealth to, to be able not to work. Mm -hmm. So I decided, why should I? Actually, I was working to increase my uh, my uh, inheritance, you know, my the, the money that I will leave for my, to my kids. And I thought it was enough at that time. So I decided mm -hmm. that not to work. And I was looking for things to do. And I came across a... Uh, a professor in Tel Aviv University who was uh, very interested in hunter-gatherers. He was an archaeologist, but uh, the archaeologists take a lot of, uh, uh, you know, analogy from uh, hunter-gatherers of today. So I went to some of the courses. Oh, so you were interested in this, in, in the archaeology and in the lifestyle, but was there any connection with diet? Did you change your diet at some point to be no actually no yeah. no uh, okay. um, it started when I, I after about two years of going to university as a free uh, listener I decided to write a book 
about what I did, about uh, actually uh, that uh, leaving work is an option. I don't think it was an option for everybody, but some people that can afford it uh, should look at it as, as an option. And uh, I started writing the book, and for research, you know, I heard about paleo. So for research, I started researching it myself. And I was writing, I had a very terrible uh, ADD. I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't write for a long time or do, or do any work for a long time, a period without uh, Ritalin. Uh, and then I did the research and I found out that uh, Ritalin or ADD and uh, gluten uh, sensitivity are associated. So I stopped eating gluten and like after maybe a few days actually, I threw away my Ritalin and I was working without Ritalin. So I realized that uh, I was eating in the wrong way all, all my life. And I became interested, more interested in the in the nutrition side than in the sort of mental side of the mismatch. Okay, so there was some uh, personal experience that that made you uh, think about diet and uh, and human uh, adaptations, right? Uh, from your own personal right. experience with giving up gluten, right, right. yeah. So let, so let's dive into sort of the key themes um, that come out of some of your research, which I think is really interesting. And but I want to start with the fact that you know we are primates; we're descended from primates. Um, but some of our early primate ancestors, uh, like modern, you know, apes and gorillas and chim chimpanzees, uh, they ate a mainly plant-based diet, um, and right. somehow we be uh, it, it, somehow later on the the Homo uh, sapiens and before that Erectus uh, became meat eaters. So, what happened there? How did we go from plant eaters to meat eaters? And, uh, you know, what's the, um, what are the factors that drove that evolution? Well, apparently there was a, already like 7 million years ago, 6 million years ago, some environmental pressure that caused uh, some of us to go leave the trees and start looking for food on, on land. Uh, I'm not sure what it was. I don't think anybody knows exactly what it was. So we became like, a, let's call it a, one of the species like Australopithecus, which is well known, uh, was actually getting food from, from the terrestrial sources. Uh, but most probably from uh, vegetal sources. <clears throat> and then the, the, there was a change and more uh, area became savanna in Africa, and savanna carry more uh, fauna uh, than the <clears throat> than non savanna. So apparently, this Australopithecus uh, split part of it, went to exploit more uh, vegetal source food, and the other the other uh, half which is actually Homo habilis, uh, started to consume more, uh, more uh, um, uh, fauna, not, not fauna, but more uh, animal food. Uh, probably starting by uh, just uh, taking stones and, and, uh, and, uh, and getting marrow from bones that were left by other uh, predators. Uh, and then becoming more and more sophisticated in that and starting to get some meat or maybe do some, uh, you know, scavenging, but uh, a little bit more aggressive scavenging. Okay, so you actually make the other predators run away. Uh, and it started developing stone tools. Stone tools first appear associated with meat consumption, with more meat consumption. And this is how we know that they started to... And, and, and of course, you find the, the bones, fossilized bones in, in, the, 
Uh, and this is uh, like uh, around Homo habilis around two million years ago or so, or when did this two start half. to happen? Two and a half million years ago. Yeah. Okay. About yeah. two and a half million years ago. Yeah. Okay. Two million years ago, uh, 1.8, 1.9, we start seeing another a Homo, Homo erectus, which was much bigger than Homo, than Homo habilis, had different teeth uh, structure, smaller, much smaller teeth uh, than, than Homo habilis. And that, that means that his diet became much more uh, condensed and much higher quality, let's say. And when you say quality, high quality diet is really, in the end, less fibrous. Because humans cannot, uh, you know, uh, exploit a lot of fiber. And you see much more bones and much more, uh, and it's, it's quite clear today, although not everybody, whatever I say here, I must say, in the, in the beginning, whatever I say here is not a consensus and it's not a unitary opinion. I have my own opinion. It's not, not that I don't have partners to that opinion, I do. But it's not like, a, you know, a, a total consensus. But my interpretation and other people's interpretation, especially the people who actually dig the sites in, in Older by Gorge, uh, is that Homo erectus was a carnivore and a, a hunter, and that the, in, in the sites you find many large, very large animals. So this is the, let's say, the way that we got into this uh, this uh, niche. So let's um, uh, uh, have you recite some of the evidence that really supports our origins as carnivores. And I know you've talked about uh, physical and atomical features in the body, our digestion, energetics, things like this. What are some? What were some of the pieces of evidence that were most convincing to you? To, to me, yeah. To me, the physiological aspects are most convincing because this is something that you know it's almost impossible to interpret in other ways. Uh, when you go to a archaeological site and find the bones, one can always say, yeah, but plants don't uh, preserve as well, so they must have had eaten a lot of plants. But when you see that our stomach acidity, you know, still today, after 10,000 years of agriculture, is still the stomach acidity of, uh, of uh, not only a predator, but a scavenger, so even even more than the predator, uh, and the reason it is a, a scavenger is because humans were kind of a scavenger, a pre, hunter scavenger, because we took the 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 meat and the fat to a central site. It's not what other carnivores usually do, uh, especially uh, social carnivores. They just get around the prey and they eat it, but we took the prey. And we guarded it because the large prey we uh, consumed over a few days or weeks, depends on the size. So, uh, so when so we actually were scavenging like scavengers on on that on that prey. So we needed the high acidity uh, to fight the pathogens. So this kind of thing, and then there is another. Uh, very, you know, something that you will never associate unless you are in this business of biology. Uh, and this is the structure of our fat cells. Mm. So we have many small fat cells. And other animals have, may have other, what we have, all they have uh, smaller, uh, but larger, smaller number, but larger size fat cells. And that exists. Now, uh, the researchers, in this case, found out that the, the, the animals that have smaller fat cells, but larger and higher number, are all carnivores. 
So they anyway. write, and this was in 1985, they wrote, it means that humans were actually carnivores. Now, nobody picked it up at that time, but uh, this is, the, for me, it's, it's the most, and, and what, the other things that I, I'm guided, and this is probably because I'm an economist by, by uh, education, Another thing that guides me very, uh, very much is the energetics. Yes, yeah, say more because about that. I think that's that's really interesting. Talk about the energetics. Yeah, energetic. Look, en energy is the coin of evolution, or the coin of life. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, follow the money. So in evolution, I would say follow the energy. And. If you look even today, or hunter gatherers, recent hunter gatherers, because this is something we could not measure archaeologically, the energetic return, net return, on hunting is in the tens of thousands of calories per hour. So some say, in some cases it's 60,000, in other cases it's 10,000, but it's, it's in that range. The return on the, on plants, on gathering plants, is around 14, 1500 calories. Mm. So it's less than 10 times, or more than 10 times, uh, that of uh, hunting. Yeah, and, and the, plants, during the, the plants during the Paleolithic were not the plants we buy in the supermarket today, right? There, there was a lot more fiber. There was a lot less available sugars. We have these rich, a sweet. Of, they, I tell you, a lot, they, lose a lot of, they lose a lot of calorie by the preparation. Yeah. Because you need to prepare most of the plants you need to prepare. Because we are not talking about fruits. Even fruits is maybe three, five, seven thousand calories per hour. It's not, it's not, it doesn't get to the, to the, you know, to the return on hunting. Uh, but it's not fruits. You have to prepare the sun, for instance, in, uh, in Namibia. Yeah, they, uh, they actually, I think Magongo nut uh, provides maybe 50% of their nutrition. But just to prepare it, they spend so much time and energy, that uh, the, the original return becomes much, much less. So this is uh, one of the reasons why gathering uh, just doesn't provide. Now, this is not by chance. It's just because we are adopted to it, okay? Mm -hmm. For, for uh, if you take uh, primates, if you take, uh, let's say, a chimpanzee, the, the ratio will not be the same. Because for them, they will not get the 10,000. Uh, because for them to hunt, they have to run like crazy. Yeah? Uh, uh, we, have, we have developed uh, um, tools to do it. So we are adapted in a way. This is, it reflects a basic adaptation to hunting as opposed to gathering. Now, so why the, people... the, the, the tools, the, the ability to run long distances... We, we could hunt in a way that other primates couldn't. So, so that, that gave us exactly, a, exactly. a way to, to adapt. Have, but then also our, our bodies changed, right? So can you say what's the evidence from our teeth and, and our digestive tracts and our jaws that show how uh, this transition to hunting affected our bodies? Yes, yeah, so I said I already talked about the habilis, the difference in the teeth between the habilis and the and the erectus, we have this, somebody built a machine, I think it cost like a million dollars, one of the researchers, and uh, the machine was like chewing, it could chew automatically, and it could measure all the pressures here and there and that and that. And he came to the conclusion that human teeth were meant to chew meat, because it, it holds the meat. Otherwise, if you take a if you take a Homo habilis chief, uh, teeth, when it chew, the teeth are flat, so the meat escape to the sides, mm -hmm. and you cannot cut the meat. But we have uh, we have tips on the on the on the on the teeth, cusps it's called, 
that, that hold the teeth so we can actually cut it. So this is one of the adaptations. Uh, the, the, the classic one, which everybody is talking about, is the adaptation of the gut, of course. And when you compare our gut with the chimpanzee's gut, you find that the, <coughs> the colon, our colon is something like 77%, if I remember correctly, my calculations, shorter or, or, or the volume is smaller than that of a chimpanzee. And chimpanzee, it's a high quality diet. It's not, it's not like a chimpanzee, it's not a cow. Chimpanzee eat fruit. And fruit is relatively high quality, but still it needs a lot of uh, space, a, a lot of volume to be able to ferment the fiber and to get the energy from the fiber. So <clears throat> our, our gut is built in a different way. We have a small colon, but a very large, relatively speaking, very large, a small intestine. And so we are built, actually we evolved away from our ability to, to extract energy from fiber. And we evolved to an ability to extract energy from fat and protein. So yes, we, we are not, the, 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 the gut is not built uh, completely uh, uh, similar to that of, uh, of uh, carnivores, uh, but still it's much, much different than uh, other animals that consume plants. Yeah, while we're on the topic of the efficiency of the digestive tract and, and you know, the ability to uh, get the energy from meat as opposed to needing this large gut for digesting uh, fibrous material and using the, the the gut floor to do that. Um, what do you, where do you place the uh, uh, invention of fire and cooking in this? Cause there, you know, this book by Richard Rangham, Catching Fire, he argued that uh, Homo erectus had the you benefit know, it's of a, it's fire. A, it's and a that, good, that allowed it's a good us timing. to, yeah, that allowed us to pre-digest kind of the, you know, the calories and so we we again get more efficient uh, absorption so where do you place the role of fire and cooking in this story uh, you know it's a, a good timing for that question because i just had uh, i'm just uh, i just sent uh, for publication a paper that uh, actually claimed that the first usage of fire was to pr protect against predators and to smoke meat rather than to cook. And I made all the calculations. Again, energy, okay? So when you, let's say you, you go cooking. So if the energy is the net energy of uh, gathering plants is uh, 14 uh, calories, 1400 calories per hour, the cooking, what the cooking add it's in the 10%. Okay? And by the way, most of the calculations are made on the potential caloric value of the plants, not on what actually we extract from the plant, which is less than the potential. But let's say at the full potential. So what is it? 40, so it's, it increases your return from 1,400 to 1,540. And, so you know it's meager compared meager. So that's, to you know, so that's that's for plants. What about cooking meat? Does cooking meat enhance? It's the same, the same. No, even same less, thing. even less. Okay, yeah, even less because uh, if you take into account that cooking uh, meat, actually meat, the return is uh, much of it is on on uh, on fat. Okay, because the the animals that they hunted uh, contained 40, 50 percent fat. In caloric terms, so if you so fat cooking fat is adds something like three percent to the to the caloric value. But, but it but it doesn't uh, reduce the the work that the intestine has to do and, and allow us to uh, have a smaller gut, for example, to uh, be able to have uh, cooked meat versus 
No, look, it, it does, by, but by, by, by small Marginal. percentage. Okay. Uh, maybe, okay. Maybe the actual chewing, you know, uh, the, the energy that you uh, spend on chewing, maybe, maybe a little bit less. But, you know, people invented the uh, stone tools to cut meat two and a half million years ago. So you don't have to cut, you know, you can have it like a Chinese do. They cut it before they eat, uh, not with the teeth. Yeah. Uh, not, so, uh, you know, anyway, uh, uh, this is the paper. So if you look at the energy, now the energy, let's say you, you hunt a, an elephant or whatever, and you get 60,000 uh, calories per hour. To, to, to protect the elephant or to protect the animal, yeah? If you don't protect, you will lose a lot of return, of energetic return. And if you, if you can smoke it and keep it, you know, edible for a longer time, you might, you return, your energetic return on the, on the, and the cost of fire, because it costs to create fire. You have to go around, collect the wood, and uh, maintain it, etc., etc. So there is a cost, also energetic cost. By the way, there is a paper uh, of uh, a researcher who did the measure how how much energy is spent collecting wood, etc. And his conclusion is that it doesn't pay economically to cook. So it depends on the circumstances. Of course, some areas have more wood than others. Blah blah blah. But but. Uh, Anyway, so this uh, catching fire and the whole uh, uh, hypothesis, you know, that uh, that cooking made us a human is uh, is not correct. But I, I'm, you know, I must say that it's we are not far away. My my hypothesis is not far away from that. It was actually meant to to. Uh, for nutrition, to keep us to keep us uh, going, and yes, it demanded the higher brain power uh, to collect wood and make a fire. Uh, so it probably was one of the reasons that our brain grew. The actually making of fire, but it was not for cooking. Um, Rangem, when he started, Rangem, by the way, is a vegetarian. Mm. And when he started, his uh, theory was, or hypothesis was that it allowed humans to eat uh, plants. Later on, he changed it and he realized that meat was important. So it was meat and plant and, met, and he made some experiments, uh, cooking snakes or something. Uh, but, but his original was, uh, and that I think he himself, uh, left this hypothesis. Anyway, cooking is not was not important. Not important? Not that it's not important today. And people cook and people, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that people don't cook. There's a lot of uh, other uh, meat becomes sweeter and uh, easier to chew and, you know, what have you. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want you to, to comment on another uh, uh, researcher, Lauren Cordain, who, as we all know, was one of the originators of the paleo diet. And he was looking at modern hunter gatherers, you know, like the Hazda. Uh, uh, and he, you know, his view looking at this was that, yes, m meat is plays a role, but there's quite of wide variability and, and meat can be anything between 20 to a hundred percent of the diet. Again, looking at modern hunter gatherers. So what was wrong with this approach to, uh, to, and his conclusions? <clears throat> I don't think anything is wrong with that approach. Uh, you know, people can be, I'm, 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 uh, I don't claim that people cannot be healthy uh, on plants, eating, you know, a, a large portion of their diet is plants. Actually, what you see, if you go to the history, you see that at the beginning of agriculture, uh, people suffered, but later on, they found ways to treat the plants and, uh, you know, to ferment and to do things like that, to prepare the, the plants. 
uh, and and so they built big, they they were quite healthy. Uh, my problem in that is that uh, the, we don't do the preparation. Nobody does. Nobody ferment, uh, you know, uh, the food before you eat it. And we count on the food that we buy uh, from uh, companies that don't care about our, uh, our health. Also, if you take, let's say, the Japanese. The Japanese, when they are in Japan, live to 90, 100. Well, they have long life. Uh, not all of them, but, you know, uh, traditionally. But the tofu that they eat is fermented like crazy. And uh, uh, so, and of course, they are also adapted. And I think the adaptation does continue. So, so they had like 10,000 years to adapt to their diet. And when they come to the U.S., all of a sudden, they become sick. Why? Because they don't eat the, the, the traditional uh, diet. Uh, the, the fact is that none of us knows what we are adapted to. Because we, we don't have a history. We are all, you know, came from a non-traditional. My, my parents came from a non-traditional society. In traditional societies, people stay at the same place in a small uh, community. And uh, if they eat something and uh, somebody becomes sick, they quite quickly find the association. And they stop it, and oh, they prepare it differently, or they do. You know, uh, Ethiopians in Israel, we have the Ethiopians, the Jews, uh, and they eat, uh, uh, instead of bread, they don't have wheat there, they have teff. And teff, they actually ferment it for two weeks before they, eat, they make the bread. Now, nobody's, I'm an economist, nobody will invest in, in two weeks' worth of inventory just for nothing. So it means that it was very crucial for their health. And this is, this is something that we don't do today. And we don't know our, our genetic composition in that respect. So I look at the whole mismatch, uh, uh, all, all the, this template as a safety template. And, this, and the safest food is meat. You just cannot, you don't have to prepare it. You just can eat it raw. You, you can cook it. You can do whatever you want with it. So that's why I... I uh, Let's go back to the Hazda, though, because I think you've pointed out that something that might have been overlooked by Cordain was he was assuming that modern Hazda were the same as ancient Hazda. Um, but you've pointed out that uh, the availability of large animals has changed. Um, can you say a little bit about your research showing that uh, early Paleolithic ancestors hunted very large megafauna and, and somehow that, that, uh, that availability has changed over time? First of all, this is even a consensus is that uh, we lost a lot of megafauna. Let's say megafauna is uh, defined as a weight higher than uh, 100 pounds. But uh, we lost a lot of mega herbivores. Mega herbivores are defined as uh, animals uh, in weight higher than 1,000 kilograms, so about 2,200 pounds. And for instance, we are, we are adapted. First of all, you, you go to uh, archaeological sites and you see, and by the way, this is what I do. Uh, one of my research uh, focus today is trying to produce papers that uh, measure the decline in prey size or, or the change, but I find a decline. Uh, uh, between uh, periods that were uh, four or five hundred thousand years ago and three hundred thousand years ago. And at that time, this is like called the Ashelian and the 
and the Middle Paleolithic, Paleolithic let's say, uh, or Middle Stone Age in Africa, and Early Stone Age, they call it. And I just had a paper, I'm also going to publish it, uh, hopefully soon, that in South Africa, in the Southern Africa, the, if you go to archaeological sites, you see a less large make, uh, mega herbivores uh, than, than uh, they were, you know, in, in the in the 300,000 years, than they were 500,000 years ago. And again, you, in the next period, yeah, which is uh, you can you can actually uh, identify, is about 40,000 years ago. Uh, the, what's called the later Stone Age in, in South Africa, you find another decline in mega herbivore. So mega herbivore declined. We found the same thing. We published the paper. We found it in the Levant, which is uh, Israel, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, there, are, there are signs that it happened everywhere. So hu- this, was, this was due to human hunters essentially caused an extinction or a significant decrease in mega herbivores. We we were the driver of that change. Is that the case? That's another paper that I have. Okay. <laughs> and I tried to show, first of all, there is, you know, th- there is a consensus around the megafauna extinction, a wave of megafauna extinction started about 50,000 years ago. It's called the late quaternary megafauna extinction. There's no argument that that happened. There is a lot of debate whether humans contributed to it or not. And I think the the debate is uh, uh, trending towards the one that think that human did it. Because whenever, wherever they came, they went, uh, like America, Australia, some islands, uh, you immediately saw a decline in, in this uh, large herbivore. So I think the, the, there is still, you know, one or two researchers that are uh, fighting against it, but most, most I think, agree with, with that uh, interpretation. A question then. So if we really did drive this extinction over tens of thousands of years or, or, or longer, um, did it have any implications for human evolution? Did it cause us to change or adapt because now we no longer had access to those very, very large animals and we had to start hunting smaller animals? Did that change anything about either our our bodies or our practices? Well, that's that's it. This is it. This is the unifying explanation that uh, of all of human prehistory, all very like uh, phenomena that you won't, wouldn't uh, connect to each other. But when you start, when you put that precise decline and the adaptation to that decline, because we were hunters and hunting is what brought us, I mean, evolution, the need to get food is the, the, the main motor of evolution. Right, because this is why you call the predators, carnivores, omnivores, herbivores. You divide animals by the way they eat. Yeah, because this is the main. So we were carnivores, and we were a special type of carnivores. That uh, and this is the next paper that I'm. I'm. Uh, I mean, almost completing it. Uh, the the. We were a special kind of carnivore. We were a late joining joiner. We just joined this mm. uh, uh, group of uh, carnivores because we were first. We came, like I said, from Australopithecus. That was not a, a carnivore, uh, and we are late comers to to this thing, and we could not adjust to consume a large quantity of protein. Mm. So we are, a, a, we can consume up to about 35% of our diet, 40% of our diet is protein, whereas other carnivores can consume, can consume 80% uh, as protein. Uh, because they, you have to remove some uh, 
you know, the nitrogen from the body, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't have uh, enough uh, uh, or large enough uh, uh, liver to turn it to urea. We don't have large enough uh, kidneys to, to remove the, the urea. So, so this is it. Now, since we are hunters, we were like stuck with the need to obtain fat. Again, from an energetic point of view, because the alternative was to obtain carbohydrates from plants. But energetically, it uh, doesn't pay. So we actually were like dependent on getting high fat animals. And the first high fat animals are the large animals. The larger mm. the animal, the fatter it is. So we were dependent on large animals. This is why you find a lot of large animals in Homo erectus. Yeah. And then when the large animals started to decline in number, we found another strategy, and this is to hunt uh, adult animals. Now, in, if you take a herd, uh, the adults have more fat than the young and the old. The young use the fat, they don't have enough uh, fat, fat to build reserves because they have to grow. The old, uh, the teeth are going bad, so they cannot uh, feed well, so they don't have a lot of fat. So the, the adults have, a fat, have the fat. So we hunted the t adults. And this is what you find. This is archaeologically very, very strong uh, phenomenon. But this is crazy if you think about it. You, you are actually running after the most uh, fit, uh, the fittest uh, group in, in the herd, right? They, they run faster, they are smarter, they are more alert. What, what predator will do that? Well, us, because we are dependent on the fat. But the, the problem is that this is the uh, age group that contribute the most, or only the age group, that co to contribute to the growth of the herd, or to maintain the, the population of the herd. So the other thing that we did is to take and exploit only the fattiest part of the animals. And this is again something that you find in the archaeological side. So it's a wasteful kind of uh, hunting because you take an animal but you use, exploit only part of it. Mm -hmm. And predators, other predators do that as well, but they do it in times of plenty. For instance, in the, in the Serengeti, okay, when there's a lot of uh, GNU going around, uh, Lions don't eat the whole GNU. They eat the fattiest part and they go. Uh, but we do it in a time of a shortage because we need the fat. And the, the, the dry periods, for instance, the animals don't have a lot of fat. So actually, when they are most uh, pressed, we add the pressure. Yeah, this, this drive to eat the healthy prime adults, rich in fat, that drove these extinctions. But then at the end of it, we've depleted the megafauna and we're left with smaller animals. So how did that affect human uh, life patterns and evolution after we had <laughs> depleted those well, large that, animals? That, uh, think also the smaller animals are running, running uh, faster and they're smaller targets. So first of all, we had to develop this, the hunting uh, weapons. And you, you see the hunting, the, the evolution, I have a paper on the evolution of hunting published, and you see that the hunting uh, technology was aimed at smaller and smaller prey. The, the, one of the phenomena, and this is the latest phenomena in terms of uh, ad adjusting or ad adapting to hunt smaller, uh, faster animals, is uh, domestication of dogs. Okay, otherwise, why would people take dogs and, and have more mouths to feed than before? Dog is a very convenient uh, uh, aid because they can digest protein to energy. They don't need the fat. So they, we hunt smaller animals. We take the fatty part. We give the dogs <laughs> the protein. Everybody is happy. You know, it's a win-win situation. So we started that's domesticating a, that's a, dogs. That's a great uh, explanation for the co-evolution of humans and, and dogs, you know, Absolutely. that partnership. Absolutely. Yeah. 
That's the great. way it probably started when we had a lot of protein uh, waste in yeah. our camps. And they came around and took it. The next thing is to start to domesticate something else, to domesticate the animals. Instead of running around looking for them, if you can build a fence and keep them in, uh, the, the energetic return gets much, much higher. And by the way, the domestication of uh, animals always entailed uh, increasing their fat content. Uh, this was one of the aims of the domestication, according to Darwin. Later on, <laughs> like 20, 30 years ago, there was a commission on how can we decrease the fat content of the animals because fat is so bad. <laughs> you know, this stupid thing. The development of ruminants uh, as herd animals and domestication of them, it, this was a natural outcome of... Uh, the need to find fat and the, the lack of availability of, the, of wild animals, right? So the domestication. Right. It just increased yeah. the energetic return. And, uh, and the next stage is, uh, it's the same. It's in parallel. It's domestic, domesticating plants. Now, some say that actually domesticating plants was to create food for the domesticated animals, but there are, uh, it's, I'm not sure about that. But in any case, the, the end result is that the return, the energetic return on domesticated plants and animals is quite high and quite it's high. sufficient for humans. Okay, so, yeah. so we, can, we can see our origins as hunters as an argument for meat. Uh, we, we've adapted to that, but evolution doesn't stop. And as you've pointed out, we can domesticate animals. We can domesticate plants. We've had 10,000 years as agriculturalists. Um, so uh, if you're really a believer in evolution and the ability of humans to adapt, uh, w why not embrace the fact that we can be agriculturalists, uh, uh, you know, and, a lot of uh, folks in the paleo community insist that we should be carnivores, that we're not that agriculture is too recent, and that we cannot have adapted to agriculture. But what do you say about that? Have we been able to adapt at least partially to agriculture? Tim Knox just published a book about uh, all the good things that come with the ketogenic diet, and in there. There is a chapter that I uh, participated in writing that described the history of, uh, of health and uh, nutrition. And he came up with a paper that in Victoria, in the Victorian times in England, the life expectancy was at certain time of the Victorian period, uh, life expectancy was high and people were healthy. And uh, uh, if you go to uh, to uh, Price, uh, again, you know, he found uh, societies that were healthy and were eating plants. Of course, they were treating the plants uh, in mm -hmm. a traditional way. And they were, like I said, uh, probably genetically adapted to the specific plants in their environment. I'm not saying that plants are unhealthy by definition. They are not. They are healthy if you prepare them properly, uh, etc. And if you are, if you are genetically, if you happen to be genetically adapted, uh, which I was, for instance, to to wheat, I was not. So uh, plants are not the the villain. Uh, by definition, carnivore, I believe everybody that can, but it's, and it's not easy, uh, be a carnivore, should do it because it's just very safe and very efficient. And you feel, I, I, I do carnivore and I feel great. I did paleo. I felt great, but I even felt better on carnivore. What can I tell you? This is like a, personal uh, anecdote 
but I'm sure I, I, I share it with other carnivores. I read it. I, I, I see. I see from testimony. This is a good um, uh, and, and maybe a, a point that's subtle for some people. You're, you're not anti-plant. What you're saying is meat is the safest. So we have the longest adaptation to that, that we do have some adaptation depending on genetics and also proper preparation we can tolerate and benefit from plants. So it's not anti-plant, it's just uh, a more of a nuanced view here, I think, right? Look, there, there are uh, uh, the people that live 90 and, and feed only on plants. <laughs> they live to 90 or 100, you know? You, you'll find the odd uh, vegetarian or, 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 you know, that everybody cited an example. Some people are adjusted to it. So for instance, uh, vitamin A. You need to have the genes to turn the the uh, plant form of of the vitamin and to turn it to to something that the body can use. Do you have the genes for that? How many genes do you have for that, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So nobody knows. We don't know. Uh, you know, if you're healthy, fine. Go ahead. Be vegetarian. This is uh, very interesting, but, but I want to, in this last part of our discussion, turn to the behavioral and cultural implications of our evolution from hunter-gatherers. Uh, and right. I think this, this book here that you've just written is, is very interesting in this respect. You've talked about the social structure of uh, hunter-gatherers uh, and how being hunters, we we worked in small groups. I think you said fifteen to fifty people. That was our society. Um, what what is what lessons can you draw from these origins in terms of our social structure, in terms of what makes us uh, a flourish and makes us happy in in these societies? Well, I've identified few uh, things that. Uh, I think still with us, uh, probably genetically, uh, that, that don't exist today uh, and did exist when we were uh, hunter-gatherers. And this is equality, is the first, and autonomy is the, the second. On those now that came out of the necessity to hunt in groups, right? Because um, absolutely, absolutely, right, we weren't individual hunters. We teamed up to get the large animals, and so how, how did that lead to this flatter, non-hierarchical organization? Just coming out of the hunting and the gathering, how did? What do you think drove that? I guess one other thing is if you look if you look at other primates like gorillas and chimpanzees, there is some hierarchy. There's an alpha male, Absolutely. right? It's yeah, and, he, yeah. and he forces his will on the s smaller guys, but that's different in, in the humans. So how does our mode of eating and hunting? This is the, this is the, structure? yeah. Right. The equality came from sharing, I think. So we, like we said, humans specialized in hunting large prey. So when you when you put when you bring the prey to the to the camp, uh, everybody feed on the same prey. Although you hunted it, actually, if you follow hunter gatherer groups, most of them don't allow the hunter to determine who gets what in the prey. He steps he steps away. It comes from and also it comes from their concept that the hunter didn't do anything special. It's actually nature gave him the, 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 the animal and the, er, nature belongs to everybody. Hmm. So the possession, the feeling of possession does not exist or it was very weak. It exists, but very weak. And the, uh, so this is a principle, a very, very important principle, and it allowed them to survive. Because uh, hunting, one, one day you get an animal, and maybe a week you don't get an animal. So you need to share the big pile of uh, energy that you, you caught, need to be shared with the group in order to allow the group 
to function. And also small groups can't exist if there is a, a inequality in the group. Is this true in other predators like canines and, uh, and, and felines too? Do they also have this equality and sharing because they hunt in groups? Uh, no, no. It's, a, it's a different degrees of equality. For instance, in the, I think hyenas are, are much more equal than, let's say, lions. Uh, um, dogs, there is the, the alpha male. Uh, it depends on the needs, you know. It, it's, it's, it's a different uh, setup. It, it, the, the business of... Uh, creating new generations and how you get the best genes to, to get mm -hmm. transferred. Uh, it's a mechanism that uh, we have different because we came from, from a different line of uh, animals. Uh, so it's, it's quite complicated, but it's not the same. But, what, but, but go going to, back to, to gorillas and chimpanzees, why do they have hierarchy? And, and what made us give that up? They don't feed, you see, they don't share their food. They, they actually, each one eat their own food. Hmm. They don't share, they don't even share it with the children. Uh, after a certain age. So, uh, it's just not the same. They don't need to share. Because their food don't, don't come in, don't come, uh, in big packages sporadically. Okay, uh, so they they can they solve the problem of maintaining the group in a different way. Humans, because the big packages of energy come, and on an un, uh, you know on a not on a daily basis, they have to share. Okay, in order for everybody to survive, and sharing. Uh, uh, sharing is just uh, uh, you have to you have to be equal to feel equal. This is a, also a fact. When you follow uh, hunter gatherers, you see there are no leaders. And I'm talking about you visited the the Hazda yourself. You visited the other Hazda, yes. groups, and and you've yes, seen I, this. I, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I I don't claim that I you know. I'm, uh, I, sp I didn't spend a lot of time. I was like a tourist. So I, I, I read much more than I saw. So uh, I can't claim to be, you know, an expert uh, 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 trusting my own eyes. But I, I, I read so much about it uh, that was written by people who lived among the Hadza. And they there's no leader. There's no, no leader. No leader. So you mentioned the equality, but it's not an enforced equality. It's kind of a natural equality, spontaneous. You also use the term autonomy. Uh, what's the evidence? Yeah. Of, what do you mean by autonomy? And uh, in a way, this is kind of odd because you'd think these groups are so tight that nobody can feel totally independent. So where's your evidence that Hunter gatherers had this sense of autonomy that they could do what they wanted. Yeah, I agree with you that is there's some kind of uh, contradiction there. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I think that what happens is that you have the options, but you don't take the options mm. in a bad way. In other words, you use the option only in a in a positive way, because if you took the options uh, and hurt the the group. It would it would help your chances of survival. So the the again the notion of autonomy comes from observations of uh, researchers that spend a lot of time with them. They don't even tell the children what to do. I'm not talking about telling other um, friends what to do. I'm talking about telling the children. Uh, there is a famous story about a group in uh, India where the government decided to uh, build them a like, fixed place to be. No, they didn't want them to. Governments don't like nomads. Uh, so they, they, they 
built them a, a, a place to live and they wanted the kids to go to school. But the kids didn't go to school, so they came to the, uh, the, like the leader that they appointed. He didn't want to be a leader, but they, they decided they need one person to talk to. So they came to him and they said, uh, you know, why the kids are not going to school? You have to tell them to go to school. And he said, I can't tell them. I don't, if they want, they will go to school. If they don't want, they will not go to school. Or they gave them, they said, we are bringing uh, new roofs for your village. Make sure that uh, you, you collect a lot of, you know, enough people to carry the roof from the road to your place. At the day, he was there alone. And they said, where are the others? He said, I couldn't tell them. I am not telling them what to do. So this is the, this is the, uh, when, you want, when you want to go hunting in a group, you just get up and you say, I'm going hunting. And if nobody joins you, nobody joins you. And if somebody wants to join you, he says, ah, I will join you. Okay, good. Nobody tells anybody what to do. And uh, this is... No, uh, no bosses. You know, There's no bosses. Yeah. No, people, no bosses. People spontaneously participate. Now, the other thing you've said that's interesting is what, what researchers have found and what you've seen is there's not a lot of, of there's not a lot of uh, time put into work. There's actually quite a bit of leisure time and that the amount of time needed for hunting and gathering is actually either just a couple of hours a day, or you might hunt a week and then there are several weeks of leisure and playing with the kids. This is, is quite interesting. So how are, are they really able to sustain themselves with so little work compared to what we do. This is actually the same with other carnivores. If you look at the Serengeti, okay, you look at the lions, they spend most of the time just lying down. Uh, they, they, then they, uh, from time to time, they go and they get up, they go on, on a hunting trip and they lie down again. So in general, Carnivores are spending much less time obtaining food than uh, herbivores. Herbivores, because the food is not, uh, is not uh, you know, high quality, contains a lot of fiber, they have to eat all the time. They have to pass, you know, through their stomach a lot of food in order to get the nutrition. Uh, carnivores, less. And humans, which are at the top of the of the chain, uh, spend even less, and they have the technology. <coughs> so, and this is what allowed us to invest more in culture, in making tools, in the teaching, you know, in transferring knowledge. So humans are they they don't work, but they are busy. I think you've pointed out this is really one of the real uh, striking aspects of mismatch is that we evolved really working a fairly small amount of the time, at least work being defined as going after food or our sustenance. And we had all of this extra time for leisure, culture, social interaction. Today, uh, that's not the case. Most people work at least eight hours a day. Some people work more than that. Um, do you think that that drives some of the health issues and social uh, maladies that we have, the fact that we're so much chained to work? Naturally. See, not only the time, but the hierarchy in work and the lack of autonomy. You know, uh, professors don't resign that often because there's a lot of autonomy in being a professor once you reach the stage. On the way to professorship, you have to lick a lot of asses, but, but uh, when you become a professor, the, your level of autonomy is so high that I think this is the best job in the world. And the, the, the system is also not that hierarch, hierarchical, hierarchical, yeah? Uh, but hierarchical systems and lack of autonomy create stress. 
uh, the capitalism is such that it organized the work, uh, it organized in, in, in a way that they will get the maximum output out of you uh, in the time that you devote to work. And in order to organize, uh, because we are all specialized today, yeah, there's a very, very detailed di division of labor, everybody specializes in something, you need a lot of hierarchy to manage all that stuff, all, all the specialized, all the specializations. So I think this is really interesting. And yet um, here we are in, in the modern Western world, dependent on technology, d division of labor. It provides many benefits in terms of standard of living, uh, health care, you can argue there, but there are some aspects there that really are beneficial. Uh, infectious disease, for example, is controlled. We have access to things that, that our ancestors didn't. So there's benefits, but then you've pointed out we're giving up uh, uh, some of the benefits of autonomy, freedom, and, 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 and uh, social harmony. So how do we bring the best of uh, our evolutionary origins in terms of social structure into a world that is specialized. Can we find a balance here? Um, is there a way to have both uh, material abundance and, and uh, high standard of living, but also the, the, uh, the happiness and health and autonomy of our Paleolithic ancestors? I must say that uh, uh, I don't have uh, solutions for the world. I, I can only advise something that also may work and may not work for, for individuals. Uh, you know, I'm a little humble, humbler than I used to be uh, in, that, in, that, in that respect. Uh, first of all, I must say that I, I met a lot of people who like their work and who like the life that they have and are happy. And so, I mean, what am, who am I to tell them that they can be even happier? But I, I don't think they would. A lot of people that leave the world. Now, I say, my, my uh, I didn't call the book, uh, the book that, that you show is, is a, the English version of a Hebrew book that was written in Hebrew. And the, it originally was called the uh, escaping to paradise or sneaking into paradise, uh, which meant leaving work is, is the way to sneak into paradise, where you get your autonomy and you get your equality and you get... So my solution, my personal solution was to quit <laughs> and to do what I want. I work very hard. I work uh, eight hours a day at least. You know, maybe some days I don't, but, but uh, when I work, I work very hard. But I work at something that I want and something that uh, I don't lose my autonomy. I have 100% autonomy and uh, nobody tells me what to do. So it's not the work itself. It's the situation. It's the, it's the situation. So professors it's the situation and, and I think also the attitude. I, I, I'm somewhat like you. I, I work. Uh, I enjoy my work. I feel I have a lot of freedom and autonomy, but I still have to deliver um, so I think some like you and, and, and me are fortunate to be able to do that. I'm just wondering for the large, uh, you know, majority of the population and because services and products have to be made, are there ways that we can build elements of, of, of this psychology into the lives of more people? Or is it always Look, going to be yeah, just you know, the lucky few, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, some of them are obvious, like build yourself a community. Uh, build yourself a community of equals. Don't try to be friend with the richer uh, uh, people, for instance. I have some rich friends I used to have. I don't cultivate that friendship. Uh because I just don't feel comfortable. Uh, in, in, uh, sometimes I feel even intimidated in, in going to a house that is so posh. 
I feel uncomfortable about it. So I have enough friends that are closer to me, economically speaking. Uh, unless, unless, you know, you have very special personality that, uh, that you can actually feel, com- feel comfortable among these people, or they have a special personality that make you feel comfortable around them. But uh, otherwise, try to be close, try to create a, a neat, tight-knit community. I live here in a building with about, uh, I think there are about 300 apartments. And we have like maybe six, seven couples that we are friendly with and that we meet quite often. And this, this is the most important group that I have because families are... My, my daughter lives in Victoria, in Canada. And my son uh, not, doesn't live far away, but we don't see him that often. Uh, and now he wants to move to Cyprus. So this is the so create yourself you have to you have to maintain and i say even sometimes let's say they don't provide the most uh, the finest intellectual uh, challenge <laughs> yeah all your friends but they are important they are important and, and the, the important to to meet people that you know people that you feel comfortable to put your legs on the table if you want with uh, that, that's, I think, is very important. Yeah, uh, I think this is this is a really key point, and this goes back to you, to the observation that we are naturally uh, evolved to be in groups of fifteen to thirty or fifty people. It's a group of known people; they're familiar. That's your community. We can have different kinds of communities: the ones in your apartment that are right. local. We can have communities of interest like Ancestral Health Society, people we see right. on a regular right. basis. And uh, this taps into this social nature that we have, right? And I think that makes – that's our, our community nature. Community is very happy. important. Very important. Sense of community, yeah. I think, I, for longevity, by the way, community is very important. I see, I see in Israel the religious people, they live a little bit longer. Uh, and I think it is because they have a sense of community. Yeah. If you look at the blue zones, you know, the, the, in, in right. Japan or in Greece, right. very much right. those, those social groups, particularly as people age, they're sticking together, right? They're not isolated and lonely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the community. Yeah. Some people try to argue that this is the, uh, fabulous plants that they eat, but this is BS. The, the community and the knowledge that they have, how to prepare food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the, was the most important in, in their longevity. Yeah. yeah. Well, and another well, thing that I want, uh, that I'm advocating in the book, is spontaneity. Whenever you can. Whenever you can. Don't plan, or you can plan a vacation a year in advance, of course, but... <clears throat> Try to get one that is like on a two days notice. Uh, uh, if you have the opportunity to do it. So, yeah. Another, th- that's another thing that we miss uh, compared to hunter together the spontaneity. Spontaneity, by the way, is an expression of autonomy. If you're autonomous, you can, you can be spontaneous. If you're not autonomous, if you have to go to work every day, 360 days, you cannot. Be spontaneous. You know, there's one other thing you wrote in the book I thought was interesting, and that is, uh, of course, it, you talk about paradise, but, you know, even in these hunter-gatherer societies, there were conflicts. There could even be uh, big disagreements and some violence. And but what you said that is what would happen when there were these divergences, the group could split. And they were nomadic. And so um, one one way of resolving disagreements is move away, form a, form a new Absolutely. group. Absolutely, they, um, well, they move. They, they move. move. If you look at the Hadza or the Sun, they move. They don't stay. I mean, not all of them move, but people just move. 
to, to a different... Uh, sometimes because they want to be with their friends and sometimes because they have uh, some kind of uh, argument. Argument, yeah. <clears throat> So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's another interesting lesson is, uh, you know, the, if you don't like the community you're in, change or, or split off. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, anyway, this has been a great discussion, Mickey. Thank you for spending mm-hmm. time uh, talking about this today. And, uh, you know, I think you've taken so many different pieces and put them into a unifying picture. Uh, it really is compelling. And yet you're modest about it. You're not saying you have all the answers. There are people with different views. But still, I think you make pretty good arguments, um, um, very persuasive ones. And you're always writing papers. The research isn't done. So can you tell the audience listening today, what are the projects you're working on now? What are some of the pieces of the puzzle that you're pursuing today? Yeah, the... the, the, the um... You know, I have this uh, theory paper that I published in 2021 that uh, says what, what I said. It is that uh, it's a unified th- theory or, or hypothesis that uh, most of our evolution is due to the decline, the coping with the decline in prey size. So this co- compels me to test the theory by uh, <clears throat> by. Uh, First of all, proving that prey did decline, because like I said, there's a consensus about the recent decline, but I'm talking about a decline that happened, uh, started maybe a million years ago. And this is something that people don't don't know, don't realize. Uh, some of them don't believe it. Some of them uh, don't know about it. Uh, so this is something that I have to sort of investigate. Okay, if I was right about an early decline. Uh, and then I have to prove the connection. And then I, so, so most of my work is geared toward, and then, and this is the last paper that I'm very excited about. It hasn't been, it was not published yet. Uh, let's see. Some papers are difficult to publish because, uh, you know, uh, there is the in science. Science is a is a social uh, endeavor. So you have a lot of gatekeepers and a lot of people that with all kind of interests and etc. Uh, etc. Et and all kind of so some some ideas are more difficult to publish than others. And I don't know how easy it will be for me to publish that, but that that. Uh, uh, theory or hypothesis that humans were the one who were responsible not only for the late quaternary extinction, but for the earlier extinctions mm. that I'm finding uh, in other places. And why, because of our uh, dependence on fat, we are the, the instigator of these uh, extinctions. Great. Well, we'll look forward to, to seeing some of these publications coming out. Um, it's amazing you're staying active in this, and I think this is one of the factors that probably drives your longevity is this passion ah. and continued interest. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> great. Well, 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 anyway, thanks for thanks for talking today, and uh, nice look talking forward to seeing you at at, uh, at future conferences. I tell you, you are a very high class interviewer. <laughs> yeah, I really. I mean, I made a lot. I did a lot of podcasts, uh, and uh, you must be one of the best. So it was a uh, pleasure. Well, you're too kind. I've 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 enjoyed having you on. I always learn a lot uh, every time we talk. So uh, take care. Okay. Take care. Um, See bye-bye. you. Bye. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.